something that fascinates me, and I, I would not only to announce it and, and tell you so that you know, uh, in case we have some objections, which I do not assume, but it is a good idea. There is a student initiative uh, which started in Oxford. Uh, some students worked together and said, let's do something uh, of a platform uh, in order to uh, show what's going on uh, in Europe, in discussions about Europe. So more than 20, what they call themselves student ambassadors, are active all over Europe. We also have a couple of um, students here at the Diplomatic Academy come to, came to me and said, let's uh, also do something here at the Academy. So I, I thank Olivier Gergely and uh, Lisa Schwarz uh, for having this brought to our attention. And um, this workshop will be filmed, so, so, so you know. Uh, and it will then be put on a platform uh, in the internet under WW European Ideas EU, uh, which will be launched on the 1st of January 2012. Thank you for inviting me. It's, uh, I think it promises to be a, a really interesting workshop, and uh, I'm delighted to be here. Um, okay, I, I've been asked to, to give um, an overview of the innovations in the Lisbon Treaty and uh, so what I'm going to do is, is, is try to highlight some of the aspects of the changes that were introduced by the Lisbon Treaty to the um, what became, what's become the CSDP, the, the Common Security and Defence Policy and, and the Common Foreign and Security Policy. I think as, as you all know that the, the um, External policy of the EU was one of the issues that was highlighted back in the Lycan Declaration, which established the Convention on the Future of Europe back in uh, December 2000 as, as, as one of the key issues which should be addressed by the Convention, and it, and it had a relatively high profile during the discussions on the Convention, and the, the Constitutional Treaty and then the Lisbon Treaty was certainly aimed to impose a, a, um, a degree of, of rationality, a rational structure um, on the external policy field, which would, um, on the one hand, codify the existing position, but at the same time would systematize and clarify um, a complex web of, of treaty, existing treaty provisions and developments um, in the law. Um, I think, uh, speaking, uh, speaking as a lawyer, but I guess what I say would be echoed by others, um, this is really only being partially achieved, and, and that is a result of a number of different factors. One of them, I think, um, the, the way in which the changes that were originally envisaged in the Constitutional Treaty were incorporated into the Lisbon Treaty's so-called two-treaty solution, you know, the idea that, that, that um, the reform was the result of amendments to the existing treaties rather than a completely clean slate. But also I think the very nature of the Union itself, which as we're in these days when the future of the Union is being debated and there's all sorts of discussion about the, the treaty reform, we, it reminds us very much the extent to which the Union is a... Um, on the one hand, an, an, an organisation of... of, of uh, considerable powers and competences, but nevertheless limited competences, and is operating in the external sphere and in the CSDP very much so alongside the member states. So we have an inherent complexity in the system, I think, which we're not going to, um, we're not going to get rid of. Um, I think uh, we, it's certainly true that the Lisbon Treaty aim to extend both the aims and the tasks of the CSDP. The Petersburg tasks were extended. Um, the union was, uh, was seen to be and was um, uh, enhancing its security and its defense ambitions, trying to, uh, the, the aim being to set itself up as a, as a global player in this field, but at the same time anchoring itself firmly in the multilateral and legal framework of the United Nations. Um, and I think that we can see that the, um, the innovations of the Lisbon Treaty is very much following in the, the line of the European Security Strategy, um, which, which was adopted in 
um, December 2003 and renewed in 2008. So I think we're, I think we're in that frame, and, I, and, we're, and we'll hear much more detail from the other speakers on, on, on a number of those aspects. So the first um, thing that I think the um, the first point that I want to make about the changes introduced by Lisbon is the extent to which the, um, the Lisbon Treaty gives in the security and defense sphere, but in the CFSP more generally perhaps, a more visible identity to the European <coughs> Union. Um, I think uh, it's obvious, uh, an obvious point to make there, um, uh, but which is ne necessary to make, is, is the creation of a, of a single legal personality for the European Union the doing away of, the, of this complexity of having the community and the union side by side. Um, it's clear that the, within the CFSP, CSDP uh, field of action, there are treaty making powers. So there is a clear international identity from the legal perspective. And I think that that, um, that was important. From, from the point of view of the, of, the, of, the, of, the, of the EU, this change, this um, creation of, of a legal personality for the EU and the getting rid of the, of the European community um, had, had an impact which could have been negative um, for, the, for the European Union in terms of its, its position in the United Nations. Um, and that's perhaps something just uh, worth, worth mentioning. It's now been, to some extent, resolved. But there are, there are of course, still questions about representation of the EU in the UN and in the UN Security Council. But because um, the, under the, the pre-Lisbon regime, the, it was the European community that had observer status in the UN General Assembly, and the CFSP side would be represented by the member state that was holding the, the EU presidency. Um, with the coming into force of the Lisbon Treaty, this created problems because the CFSP was now supposedly is now supposed to be represented externally by the presidency of the council, Van Rompuy, and by the high representative. Um, but neither of these have any formal status or had any formal status in the UN or the UN General Assembly. And conversely, the presidency, the rotating presidency, had lost mm -hmm. its external face. And, and actually, um, I would say, just as a footnote, I'm not going to uh, go into this in detail because it's something that's not directly relevant to today, but this has caused um, a, a huge amount of, of um, well, perhaps one, should, one could even say squabbling um, <laughs> within, uh, with, within Brussels, because the, the, the presidency, the rotating presidency, is actually a very useful formula to represent the collectivity of the member states. And with the disappearance of that, for, of that, of that possibility, the member states have been somewhat at a loss in situations where they did not feel that they wanted to be represented by the high representative or by the, um, the presidency of the council, of the, of the European Council. Um, so I think that this, this is something which created a tension internally within the EU, but it also created specific problems within the UN because um, it, it left the, the CFSP without a without a formal voice according to the EU's own rules. And, uh, and so it was, it, it, you, you, you remember that the EU tried to get a, um, a change to the position of the European Union, agreed within the General Assembly in September 2010, but failed rather ignominiously because it, well, I think because the Union assumed that the rest of the world would agree readily and it, and it was not prepared to do so, but of course there was a lot of politics behind that. But finally, the, uh, in May 2011, May this year, the General Assembly um, did pass a resolution which has improved the position of the EU considerably in terms of um, giving it the right to speak uh, as such, and the right to make proposals, propose amendments, and so on. Not, not voting rights, of course, but nevertheless, I think that's an important, um, that's an important point to make. And this is something which was in a way triggered by the coming into force of the Lisbon Treaty. Then, um, uh, secondly, I would want to mention the fact that the Lisbon Treaty, um, and this is an aspect which the lawyers um, get very involved with, uh, brought together the, the former European 
European Union and the European community into one single legal framework, one single legal order. We have two treaties, but one single legal order. And um, you'll recall that Article 1 of each of the two treaties refers to the treaties as having um, not only being the foundation of the Union, but also being of equal value. Um, so there is this single legal order. Uh, it's a single union. Um, they are uh, they're bound very closely together, the two treaties, in terms of the drafting. I, I won't go into the detail of that, but it's, it's, a, it, it's, it's quite um, cleverly done. There is a single set of objectives for, uh, for, the, for the European Union. Um, there is uh, an Article 2, which establishes the values of the Union. Article 3, its overall objectives, including Article 3, Paragraph 5, which specifically refers to external objectives. Um, in fact, though, I have to say, as you will know, it, the only substantive area of activity which is divided between the two treaties is external action. But at the same time, this, is, this has, still has one set um, of general principles and objectives which we find um, uh, expressly stated to apply to all areas of external action. But there is this uh, separation, and um, we do find still the common foreign and security policy in um, one of the two treaties, the TEU, and other elements of external policy in the TFEU. And it's still the case that the CFSP is treated as a kind of sui generis competence, um, in, where competences are defined in the TFEU. It's not characterized, of course, as an exclusive competence, but neither is it characterized as a shared competence or as a supporting competence or any of the other particular categories of competence. It's given its own, uh, its own space and its, its own definition. Um, so it is separated from the other competences. Um, and I think when I, when I was commenting on the Constitutional Treaty, one of the comments that I had was that it was clear that the drafters of the Constitutional Treaty wanted the CFSP to be seen as separate, but at the same time it was not made clear enough that it was separate and how it was separated and how it was different. And I would say from that perspective, um, although it's a little bit of heresy to some um, EU lawyers, perhaps I would say I welcome the fact that in the Lisbon Treaty, the separate, the distinctiveness of the CFSP is made more clear. Um, and it's clearer where it lies. There's less ambiguity, and I think that's a good thing. So Article 24 of the TU talks about the specific rules and procedures of the CFSP. We've got, um, uh, this isn't something I don't think is a good thing, but it's nevertheless clear um, that the jurisdiction of the court is largely excluded, but not completely excluded. There are exceptions, which I think will prove to be quite significant. Um, we've got different decision-making procedures. We've got a, 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 um, the, the different roles for the institutions. We have a, um, the norm of unanimity, and so on and so forth. So what I, what I'm, what I, what I would want to say there is that we have what we have um, following on from the Lisbon Treaty is a single legal order but with special rules for the, the CFSP. What, what, I, what I want to say about this, though, is that I think um, my argument would be that the pre-Lisbon relationship between the European community and the um, European Union um, has, has, in fact, fundamentally changed. Um, although we have special rules and procedures for the CFSP, um, the, the relationship between the general and the special is a, is a different one from, from the way it was before. What we have now is effectively a position whereby the general rules will apply unless there is a specific exception made. Um, in, whereas in the previous, under the previous regime we had, the, the CFSP was in a completely separate treaty and there was no reason why the provisions of the EC treaty should be applied in the CFSP. Now we have a completely different system. We're told that we have an integrated system, that the two treaties have to be read together. Um, so there is a real debate about the extent to which the general provisions in the, in the TFEU 
could be applied to the CFSP. Um, we could talk about that if you're interested in it. But I think that, if you like, the, the rule exception um, relationship has changed so that we now have um, the rule is now that the general rules will apply unless the CFSP provisions make a, a special uh, a special rule, which of course in many cases they do. Um, then we have um, uh, the the fact that the um, the Lisbon Treaty defines uh, a set of, of general objectives for external action, as I've already said. Um, and it also gives the Union a set of specific tasks in relation to um, CSDP. I think it's, um, it, it is significant. Um, it, 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 it's easy to dismiss um, rhetoric and, 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 and words, but I think it's significant that the Lisbon Treaty does give an explicit external mandate to the European Union. It gives it a, an, an explicit um, set of, of external objectives in the, um, I'm sure you're all familiar, familiar with the, with the, um, the phrasing of Article 3, Paragraph 5, um, and uh, Article 21.1, the, the general phrases about the, um, the, the role of the Union in the world. And I think um, it's important that the, um, uh, that the, the, the treaties do that. Um, but at the same time, it also does give specific tasks to the CSDP, uh, whereas, the, whereas the Common Foreign and Security Policy as a whole has a very wide scope of competence. Um, it's said to apply to all areas of foreign policy and all questions related to the Union security. Um, there aren't any specific objectives, and this is a change from the pre-Lisbon um, uh, treaty system. There are no specific objectives that are given to the CFSP as such, the Conform Security Policy as such. There are general objectives that the Union has in for all its foreign policy, which include um, uh, um, supporting the United Nations, promoting international peace and security, the promotion of human rights and the rule of law, all kinds of general objectives of that kind. But there aren't any specific objectives for the common foreign and security policy. But when we come to the CSDP, the common security and defense policy, then in that section of the chapter, we do find we can say perhaps that there is an objective, though I'm not quite sure what it means. Perhaps other panelists will uh, have, have a view on this. The, we could say that there is a specific objective of the progressive framing of a common defence policy, I mean, whatever that might actually mean, but the idea of having a common defence policy is set as an objective. But in, in, it also, there are specific tasks set out in Article 32 um, of the TEU, and, and those tasks are of two kinds, I think, essentially. Firstly, we've got the tasks that are directed outside the Union, the Petersburg tasks, Part 42, paragraph 1, missions outside the Union for peacekeeping, conflict prevention, strengthening international security in accordance with the principles of the UN Charter. And these include, um, to find more precisely in Article 43, 1, joint disarmament operations, humanitarian and rescue tasks, military advice and assistance tasks, conflict prevention and peacekeeping, uh, combat forces in crisis management, including peacemaking and post-conflict stabilization. And all of these may contribute to the fight against terrorism. So this is, um, these are tasks of the CSDP outside the Union. But then there is a second type of task, I think, um, we can say, which is to operate within the Union. Um, because after all, this is a, a defense, this is moving towards a common defense policy, so it isn't only about outside, but also the internal security, the security of the Union itself. And here um, we have the, the provision in the, the, the um, provision, the Solidarity Clause, essentially, Article 42, Paragraph 7, um, saying that if a member state is the victim of armed aggression on its territory, then the other member states shall have towards it an obligation of aid and assistance by all means in their power. 
in accordance with Article 51 of the UN Charter. And that, and that um, is then echoed by the Solidarity Clause itself, Article 222, um, which relates to the Union and the Member States acting jointly in the spirit of solidarity in, in a case of a terrorist attack or, or natural or man-made disasters. So, the, the, within the, the frame of the CFSP, the CSDP has the most concrete tasks and objectives, I think, <coughs> um, set out. And then um, I wanted to, to make um, two, two other um, points about the, the nature of the Lisbon uh, changes and the Lisbon reforms. One of them is, um, the first one is that it, I think it's true to say, when, when, what exactly will, how it exactly will play out in practice, I think it's a bit too early to say, but it is true to say that the, the treaties um, do impose now stronger, there are stronger commitments on the member states. There, is a, a, um, there are provisions which are designed to bring the member states together more, more firmly, more strongly within the CSDP. There is, um, uh, for example, one effect of the um, bringing together of the two treaties is that the loyalty clause, with Article 4, Paragraph 3 of the TU, which requires the member states to um, comply with their obligations under the treaty and support the union's objectives, which is um, directly a direct copy, pretty much, of Article 10 of the EC Treaty, but that loyalty clause applies throughout the CFSP, the CSDP, as well as to the former non-CFSP um, competence areas. Quite how it, how it will apply is, a, is another matter, and of course we do have the, uh, the question mark over the justiceability, given the limited jurisdiction of the Court of Justice, but we could talk about that. But in addition to that, we also have the more specific CFSP loyalty clause in Article 24, Paragraph 3, um, which I won't read out to you, but I just want to mention uh, uh, um, some of its, of its characteristics. First of all, it, um, it emphasises the binding nature of CFSP acts on the Member States. Secondly, it refers not only to loyalty, but also to mutual solidarity. So it's, it's not only about loyalty to the Union, but mutual solidarity between the Member States. And we just, um, I just referred to an example of that. Um, on the other hand, it also makes explicit that there, is, that there are interests of the Union uh, to be defended and to be promoted. So we've got solidarity between the Member States, but also interests of the Union, not only the collective interests of the Member States. Um, and then we have um, explicit, um, uh, an expl the explicit reference to the Member States' duty to um, refrain from action which is likely to impair the, the effectiveness of the Union as a cohesive force in international relations. So there is a, um, an, an, ex, an explicit reference there to the duty on the Member States to promote the, the Union in the international, the role of the Union in the international sphere. I've already said it, it you know, remains to be seen how these obligations can, uh, can really be enforced. Um, they are, it's a legal obligation, but the duty for ensuring compliance lies with the Council and the High Representative rather than with the Commission and the Court, as we find um, in non-CFSP areas. So um, it, it's, it's, a different, it's a different type of, of, um, of compliance. Um, there are other ways in which, and I, um, I, I, I know I must uh, keep my eye on the time, the other ways in which the Lisbon Treaty um, imposes stronger obligations on the member states. And, and um, I would just want to mention, I think, the, um, the fact that if, 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 as the treaty envisages, the CSDP is to have an extended ambition, that requires greater operational capacity. Now, I'm not the one to talk about um, to what extent that can be achieved. There will be others, others here who, who will do that. But um, I, I would just note that there is a commitment in um, Article 42.1, 42.3, that the member states are to make um, 
uh, their capabilities available to the union. Now, I mean, this means that uh, on the one hand, yes, this is a, a requirement on the member states. On the other hand, we must also note that what this means in practice is that, um, that, that there aren't any union own resources, that the union in this area of policy is dependent on the operational capacity and the resources of the member states. And that has long-term implications for the way in which this, this policy is going to develop. Now, um, I think um, my final point um, in relation to this, this, this very much of an overview, as you can tell, um, is that alongside this, this um, emphasis, or increased emphasis on, on commitment from the member states, on the unity, on the integration of the CFSP in, the, in other union policies and all of this, on, alongside all that, we have um, a considerable emphasis in the post-Lisbon treaties on flexibility within the CSDP. And I think this is perhaps the most characteristic uh, feature of the Lisbon reforms. The most obvious example of that is the extension of the possibility of enhanced cooperation to defence. Um, the uh, enhanced cooperation was, um, uh, was introduced um, into the treaty structure for the first time um, with the Treaty of Amsterdam. Um, it, at the time of the um, uh, Treaty of Nice, the possibility of enhanced cooperation was extended to the CFSP, but the military and security and defence matters were excluded. Um, now, with the Lisbon Treaty, we have enhanced cooperation as a possibility, also in the um, military and defence fields. So this is this is one um, uh, possibility. But in addition to that, um, there are other um, flexibility differentiation methodologies in the in the Lisbon um, Treaty that have been, some of which have been um, have been were existing before, some of which are new. And um, moreover, what is striking is that some of these forms of flexibility operate precisely within the military and defence um, sphere. And I think that my um, reading of this, um, and I'd be interested to hear what others would say about this, is that is that flexibility is um, actually inherent in the development of a common security and defence policy. Um, it's inherent both because there are differences between the member states in relation to their international defence commitments, what the treaty calls the specific character of the security and defence policy of certain member states. So there is a differentiation between the member states in that way. And secondly, the point that I've already made that the a fully-fledged uh, um, common um, security and defence policy imposes um, significant commitments as regards operational capacity on the member states, and the member states are uh, differentiated from each other both in terms of their capacity and in terms of their willingness um, to contribute to that. So I think it's, um, for, those, for those reasons, I think that um, it's not perhaps surprising that we have um, an emphasis on flexibility and differentiation in the, CF, um, in the uh, CSDP uh, provisions. I'm, I'm not going to say more now, I think, about um, enhanced cooperation and the scope of enhanced cooperation. I can talk more about it if, you, um, if, you're, if you're interested in it. Um, in terms of the um, other forms of flexibility, I would want to mention the, um, the provision for the delegation of specific operations to one or more member states under Article 42, Paragraph 5 and 44. And this was a, um, as so often in the Lisbon Treaty, this was a uh, putting into treaty form a practice which had already emerged. Um, the, uh, and the, um, in addition to that, then the second element is the um, permanent structured cooperation um, provisions and the protocol on permanent structured cooperation, which um, uh, no doubt we can say more about. I, I, just as a, as a final thought, I, I think that um, we should also remember that, that there is the possibility in the um, 
uh, in the context of CFSB decision making. Um, although the norm is for unanimity, there is this possibility of the constructive abstention, um, which allows a member state not to um, uh, associate itself with a particular CFSP decision, but at the same time not to block the others from proceeding. That seems to me to be a lighter form of flexibility which is likely to be more useful than enhanced cooperation. I think it's interesting that enhanced cooperation has not been used in the CFSP since it was available, and uh, I, I'm not sure that I, that I think it's very likely to be used. Um, I think much more useful are the other forms of uh, the delegation of the possibility of acting to able and willing member states and possibly permanent structure cooperation um, and, the, and the possibility of uh, constructive abstention. Those flexibilities seem to be to me more useful than the, um, the possibility of enhanced cooperation. Okay, I will, I will uh, stop there. Thank you very much. Thank you.